So imagine for a moment that you were living in a place where your children had a one out of five probability of dying before the age of five. That's a pretty terrifying prospect, right? But that's the reality for hundreds of millions of people living in Africa. And there's really only a few causes for this high um, death rate among children. The first one is malnutrition, um, acute respiratory diseases, diarrheal diseases, and of course, malaria. So 200 million people get sick by malaria every year, and still 630,000 people die from malaria, which is a treatable and lastly preventable disease. Now, on this map, geographic regions of the world are represented, scaled proportionally to how much malaria they experience. And as you can immediately see, Africa really jumps out. And in fact, 90% of malaria deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa, and the majority of those are children. And there's actually a reason why children are particularly badly affected by malaria, and that is uh, because if you are repeatedly infected with malaria over time, you build up a sort of partial immunity that provides um, some protection against the worst effects of the disease. So essentially, children that are born in Africa have to suffer repeated bouts of life-threatening illness before they build up some of the protection that, um, that this immunity provides. Um, so why is Africa hit so hard by malaria? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, there's a few species of malaria um, parasite that cause disease in, in humans, and one of these, Plasmodium falciparum, is particularly nasty, and that causes what we call um, malignant malaria. And it happens to be that almost all of the malaria in, in Africa is caused by this malignant um, malaria-causing species, whereas in other parts of the world, other species are more prevalent. But there's another reason. Um, Africa also happens to be home to many highly effective malaria mosquitoes. And so here we're looking at one, um, it's called Anopheles gambi, and this is the most important malaria mosquito in Africa and of the world. And this is the most dangerous animal species on the planet. There's not a single other animal that causes as much misery and suffering to humankind as this mosquito. And the reason why it's such an effective malaria mosquito is that um, it's highly adapted to humans. It breeds in close proximity to humans, but more importantly, it really likes to take its blood meals from humans. And it's really very good at sniffing out humans as a host. And there's a very nice study um, from the 1970s that illustrates this point. Um, uh, people went into a, a camp in northern Nigeria in which humans were outnumbered by cattle, 11 to 1, so very few people, lots of cattle. And they went in and they collected mosquitoes that had taken a blood meal the day before. They analyzed the blood meal to see what host these, um, these blood meals came from. And they found that even in those conditions, 80% of Anopheles gambi had taken a blood meal from humans. So they're really quite good at smelling out a human. Um, that's not all bad news. There's some good news in malaria. And that is that in the last 12 years, there's been a real resurgence and a renewed interest in combating malaria, particularly in Africa. And that's demonstrated very nicely by the uh, increase in international funding available for malaria control. If you look at the year 2000, only several tens of millions of dollars were available for malaria control. And now in 2013, we're up to two billion and it's um, project projected to rise further in the near future. So how is all this money being used? Well, uh, two primary, wa primary ways. The first one is to diagnose and treat people suffering from malaria with a mixture of um, very effective anti-malarial drugs. But also we spend a lot of effort doing vector control, trying to suppress uh, mosquito populations. So there are essentially two vector control, vector control tools that are highly effective in sub-Saharan Africa. The first one is indoor residual spraying, which hits the mosquito where it likes to rest. And in indoor residual spraying, we go periodically, every six or 12 months or so, inside everybody's house and spray the indoor walls with a long-lasting insecticide. And this works because malaria mosquitoes, they like to feed at night when people spend a lot of time indoors, and they quite happily go inside to go look for a host. So they take a blood meal, they get all swollen and bloated with, the, with their food, and then they need a place to rest and digest this meal. And quite often they stay indoors and rest on the walls of the houses where they then get knocked out by the insecticide. Um, a very highly implemented vector control tool in Africa as well as um, bed nets. You're all familiar with bed nets, I'm, I'm sure. Um, nowadays, these are mostly long-lasting insecticidal bed nets in which the insecticide is incorporated inside the fabric and released slowly over time. 
And this protects people that sleep on their bed, both from the bites, but also suppresses mosquito populations because of the action of the insecticide. Now, there are, of course, some problems with these tools. Um, there's widespread insecticide resistance, um, and there's also some indication that mosquitoes may actually be changing their behavior to um, feeding more outside and earlier in the evening, and people are not protected by IRS or bed nets. But nonetheless, these are highly effective control tools, um, regardless of the, the, the resistance and change in behavior. And these are the best tools we have, and we need to implement them on a larger scale. So this reinvestment in, um, in malaria control has paid off, in, paid off in a really big way. Since the year 2000, we've seen about a 50% drop in mortality due to malaria. And if the trend continues, we can expect that childhood mortality due to malaria will have decreased by uh, close to 70% by the year 2015. So that's good news, but much more uh, needs to be done. And in fact, in the last 12 years, 3.3 um, million lives are estimated have been saved due to this increase in control, 3.1 million of which um, are people living in Africa. Um, and then another thing happened in 2007, the international community decided that um, we should no longer be simply satisfied by controlling malaria, we should aim much higher and we should aim to eradicate malaria and wipe it off the face of the earth. Now this is a very laudable goal and really gives us something to shoot for, but it's actually not going to be quite that straightforward. And the reason is that um, even controlling malaria is, is difficult and eliminating malaria from areas with very high transmission is going to be very difficult indeed. And this is nicely illustrated in this graph. So on the x-axis here we have the number of times people get infected on average in a given year. And here on the y-axis we have the percentage of people in the population walking around with malaria parasites in their blood. So if you look at this uh, upper right hand corner of the graph from there we're talking about they were looking at uh, populations that have um, extremely high transmission and if you were living in one of these areas you and you were not protected by bed nets or IRS you would get infected with malaria approximately 700 times a year okay that's multiple times a day okay and if you live in an area like that we have a lot of people walking around with parasites in their blood right that makes sense now, with um, existing vector control tools, we can do a lot to reduce that transmission. And let's say if we are really successful, we can reduce it a hundredfold and bring it all the way down to seven infections a year. But then you still get infected seven times a year with malaria, which is still a lot, and you still end up with about 40% of the people in the population um, walking around with parasites in their blood. So in order to mal eliminate malaria in these high transmission areas, we need to go all the way from 700 times a year all the way down to here where there's almost no transmission at all, right? And um, in order to do that, we really need to either hit the parasite very hard with an extremely effective vaccine, or we need to wipe out these mosquito populations, or perhaps we need to change these mosquito populations in such a way that they can no longer transmit malaria or that they are no longer attracted to humans. And this is where my lab gets in. Um, we are interested in understanding what attracts mosquitoes to humans. So what is needed for malaria elimination? Um, so we have effective tools, but it's widely considered that they're not going to be sufficient to eliminate malaria from high transmission areas. So we desperately need new tools. Fortunately, there's many different labs around the world working to develop new tools. And I've just listed a few of them here. Um, you may be aware that there are now several uh, promising candidates for malaria vaccines that are being tested. Um, people are also testing um, newly developed odor beta traps that attract mosquitoes in very large numbers to see if that helps in reducing malaria transmission. Uh, people have recently realized that an infection with a symbiotic bacteria called Wolbachia that lives quite happily in many different insect species, if you inf infect that uh, a mosquito population with that bacteria, it no longer is very good at transmitting malaria. And then there's quite a lot of um, work going on in developing transgenic mosquito technology. So the idea here is that we would take, for example, a lethal gene and spread that into a population to help suppress the population, or alternatively, we might look for a gene that provides the mosquito with immunity against the malaria, spread that into a population, or, again, uh, we could, uh, alternatively, we could take a gene that changes the behavior of the mosquito, spread that through population, and then end up with a mosquito population that is no longer attracted to human host, but is attracted 
to um, other animals. So my lab is trying to understand what are the genes that are responsible for the attraction of um, Anopheles gambi to humans. And so we know this involves the olfaction system, the way um, mosquitoes smell. And smell takes place in the antennae and palps, which are little appendages attached to the mouth parts. And there are a couple of proteins are, um, that relate from gene families uh, in these um, appendages that play a major role. There's several types of receptors. They basically sit in the neurons, they bind the odorant, and then um, that starts a signal that goes to the brain. And there are also a group of odorant binding proteins which play a role in capturing odorants and transporting them from the outside to the receptor that sits in the neuron. So all mosquito species have these genes, so what we're trying to do is to identify differences between these genes between mosquitoes that are attracted to humans and those that are not. So what we use for that is um, the fact that Anopheles gamia is a closely related species that is not attracted to humans. It's called Anopheles quadrinolatus. And if you compare them in a the lab, you find that Anopheles gambi is very much attracted to human odor, whereas the other one is attracted to cow odor. They're also very closely related, so we can still mate these mosquitoes. And by doing that, we create individuals that have a genome that is a mixture of the genome of the, the one that prefers humans and the one that prefers cows. So with all these different individuals, we can determine their host preference and determine for each individual what the makeup of their genomes are. And by putting these two pieces of information together, we can produce what is called a genetic map. So this is what we've done. We've produced a genetic map, and um, this is what, uh, what it looks like. On the x-axis here, we have the chromosomes, or the genome, of the mosquito. On the y-axis, we have the probability that on each of the positions along the genome, there are genes located that play a role in human host preference. So what we found is six small regions of the genome that we now know contain genes responsible for the attraction of Anopheles gambi to human odor. Um, so that gives us a list to start with, but there's other ways in which we can um, find the most promising genes within that list. And one way is by looking at gene expression. Um, if you remember from your uh, biology class, um, you start off by, by DNA, which is what your genome is made of, um, that gets transcribed into messenger RNA that then gets translated into protein which performs the biological function. But by looking at the amount of messenger RNA um, for each gene, we can basically see how much expression is present for each gene. So we've done this for the antennae for both Gambi and Quadrinolatus. And the idea here is that genes that are highly expressed in the antennae of Gambi, but not in those of Quadrinolatus, are likely to play a role in the preference for human hosts. Now, I don't have time to show you all the data, so I just want to um, narrow it down a little bit. So we started off by with 182 genes total involved in the sense of smell with, in mosquitoes. And by using our genetic map, we narrowed that down to 38 genes. So these are the genes that are located inside those peaks that I showed you on the genetic map. By looking at the gene expression, we identified 43 um, olfaction genes that are highly expressed inside uh, the antennae of Gambi, but not in quads. And if we overlap those, we find 11 of those genes are located inside the peak. So those are the most promising candidates. Those are the ones we're really going to look at in, in more detail. So this is one way in which we can narrow down um, this list of genes. The second is by looking at um, the evolution of these genes. So it's possible that there might be structural changes in some of these genes that, for example, change the binding of particular odorants so that it now binds a different odorant than it used to. And these changes we can identify by looking at the gene sequences of all the genes in, the sp in various species um, of mosquitoes. So here we have a diagram that basically represents the relationship between these species. So what we're looking for are olfaction genes that sh have changed in Anopheles gambi, but not in any of the other species. So this is work that we're doing um, right now. And then we'll provide another bunch of genes that we um, then will look at in more detail. And the way we will do that is by generating knockout strains in which basically we disable these genes and then see what uh, the effect of that is on the mosquito host preference. So this work tells us a lot about the, uh, the basic biology of mosquitoes, but it also um, will provide a, list of, a small list of, of genes that we can then used to transform mosquito populations so we can throw the mosquito off our scent and work towards uh, better ways of controlling malaria and hopefully eventually um, reach the goal of malaria eradication. 
Um, many thanks to the collaborators on this project, and um, thank you for your attention.